Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure really to join you all today. And uh, I say this as someone who's served on your board and welcomes the opportunity to see you all, even if it is virtual. Uh, I think this is a particularly good time to uh, discuss our relationship uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the most obvious one, of course, uh, is that we've just come out of a, a visit to Washington, D.C. The prime minister was there. Uh, he had a bilateral visit. In fact, his first uh, uh, visit uh, meeting in person with President Biden as president. Uh, and that is important in itself. Uh, but uh, more than that, there was also a Quad uh, in-persons leader summit, uh, and the first one again. Uh, so that too was uh, very, very noteworthy. Uh, and as you all know, this is a time when the UN General Assembly meets uh, the high-level segment. And uh, so, you know, you know, traditionally, end September is a time for a kind of a global stock taking. Uh, so. Uh, whether it's bilateral, whether it's uh, a kind of a, a group, a plurilateral uh, effort or a larger global uh, uh, sort of assessment, as I said, this is a very, very good time to discuss our relationship. Now, if I were to give you a single message coming from all of that, uh, that message would be that in terms of the big picture, the, the issues of the day and how do we deal with them, how do we respond to them. I think today there is a very good fit between India and the United States. Uh, and uh, to me, it was very telling uh, that the uh, outcome document from the bilateral visit actually is called a partnership, India and US, a partnership for global good. Uh, and I'm sure many of you would agree that this is not a phrase which we would have used even five years ago. So it tells you really how far the relationship has come. Now, where is the relationship today? Uh, I think it has grown over the last 15 years. It continues to, uh, to progress very steadily. Uh, trade uh, is uh, around $150 billion level. It, of course, came down last year to 120, but I'm very confident this year, in fact, it would go even higher. Uh, investments, that's a tricky one. You know, you normally don't get good uh, figures and the routing confuses people. Uh, but the fact that uh, last year we got the highest ever FDI at $82 billion and a very large part of it was America, uh, I think should tell us something. Officially, of course, the, uh, in the investment uh, which we record uh, coming out of the U.S. is $62 billion, but my sense is it is very much more than that. Uh, defense has seen, again, continuous progress uh, in terms of defense trade. Uh, we had a recent acquisition of the MH-60R helicopters, the Harpoon missiles. But more than the trade itself, I think the policy exchanges have been very uh, effective. Uh, the exercises uh, between our militaries uh, continue. Uh, the framework for cooperation has actually steadily uh, kind of uh, gathered uh, more substance and obviously provides more opportunities. And uh, apart from these, uh, if you look at the, you know, what's really uh, been the defining characteristic of our relationship, which is the people to people ties, the science and technology, innovation, uh, connections that we have, the flow of students, which is so important uh, for us. I think all these, uh, despite the COVID, uh, have actually uh, progressed. Now, uh, interestingly, actually, in fact, the COVID itself has helped to reinforce our bonds. Uh, when we had the uh, second wave uh, this summer, uh, which was exceptionally severe, uh, in the U.S. was one of the countries which really stepped out for us. Uh, I think uh, uh, Doe Wilson spoke about, uh, you know, what they had done. Uh, but, you know, I, I, it would only be right on this occasion for me to use this forum to express my appreciation uh, for what the U.S. generally, U.S. business, U.S. ISPF have actually uh, done uh, on that occasion. 
Now, uh, while I've spoken about the relationship, I think it's also important that at the American end, uh, uh, there is a, a good appreciation of the changes which have taken place in India at this very time, because that would enable us really to uh, look at future possibilities in a, uh, in a more constructive way. Uh, one change, of course, emanates from the COVID. All of us have been through, through this trial. How we have each come out is is a is a individual uh, story, uh, but the fact is that uh, after going through uh, you know a situation where we had more than four hundred thousand cases case loads on a daily basis, today our numbers are very much smaller. Uh, a large part of the challenge is behind us, which doesn't mean, of course, that we let our guard down. And uh, probably the most effective uh, response we have is in terms of vaccination. Uh, we are we are today vaccinating more than 10 million people on a daily basis. There's been a one day, of course, when we reached 25 million. Uh, so uh, the uh, the fact that you know the COVID response, not just you know, between us, but also how, and I'll come to that perhaps when we uh, get into a discussion on the Quad, what do we do to help the world, as I say, a partnership for global good. The other uh, uh, noteworthy point has been that uh, in our responses, we have actually been fiscally very sensible. You know, a lot of our response has been the right degree of support at the right time, at the right place on the right issues in the right manner. So uh, while responding to the growth challenges and the recovery challenges of COVID, uh, actually we have done it in a manner in which with a great deal of responsibility, with a, uh, with a much more, I would say medium term strategy to of, of recovery. Uh, and uh, that is of course beginning to uh, yield dividends now. Uh, while the, even while the COVID was going on, uh, you actually uh, had a country which has not sat, or a government and a government which has not sat on its hands. Uh, we've it's again interesting to see big reforms have taken place at this time. Uh, the production linked incentive uh, reform, which has really given a boost to manufacturing, uh, the labor code reform, uh, the agricultural reforms, which have given small farmers a fairer deal and is really encouraging greater agro-businesses. Uh, uh, the education reform, I think some of these, even the uh, National Asset Monetization Program, uh, I think these are very noteworthy features of what has happened in India, and I think uh, American business should really study that uh, carefully. And as a result of which, we have today, I think, a fairly a robust recovery on the way. Uh, there is a great deal of confidence that we would uh, meet our 9.5 percent growth target. Uh, tr trade exports have been actually very, very strong uh, as well. Uh, that too is a good sign and speaks for our greater uh, competitiveness. Now, as uh, we look, sit down with our American partners and look at the world, I think there are three big regional uh, issues, theaters, which are uh, uh, important in that discussion. One, of course, is in South Asia itself, where historically we have not always worked together. Uh, I think that's beginning to change, and that's uh, good for both of us. Uh, the second is the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, the, the arena and the challenges of that arena uh, I think are quite unique. They are still unfolding. Uh, in many ways, this is where uh, uh, the the commitment to global good uh, will be tested, and it's uh, uh, this is among the many solutions for that. Of course, is the quad platform on which uh, we have both agreed to work together, and uh, uh, the developments uh, which have happened in Afghanistan, what they mean for our security, your security, regional and global security. So, uh, and finally, because as I said, I'm here for the uh, Unga, and this is a time for global stock taking. I would conclude by uh, underlining that uh, at the United Nations, at the multilateral are you know uh, arena in general, there is much greater cooperation and a meeting of uh, minds on many issues. Uh, than we've had before. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we agree on everything. I think we come 
from different places with different histories. But certainly that too is has evolved very, very positively. So overall, I would present to all of you a very positive picture of a relationship. Uh, we are at an important juncture. I think the discussions in Washington have opened up many more new possibilities. They have indicated a, a direction, not just for our relationship, but also for how we work with our friends and partners. Uh, so perhaps uh, these might serve as uh, adequate opening remarks for Ambassador Wisner uh, to quiz me further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now invite USISPF board member, Ambassador Frank Wisner to join us to moderate the conversation with Dr. Jai Shankar. Mr. Minister, again, <clears throat> welcome. I'm delighted you're able to take the time to be with us and to do as you just done, set a broad stage <clears throat> view of the U.S.-India relationship. Um, but I'm going to ask you if you could take even a step back from that. Uh, we are watching the world go through quite fundamental changes, transformations that are affecting literally every nation. And the last several months, as you noted, have been really tumultuous. Afghanistan, uh, the collapse of the government there, the <clears throat> Uh, events and tensions in the South China Sea, the Quad, uh, the AUKUS uh, agreement and controversies with Europe on the American front, many other events, hunger, you've noted. So as India sits back and looks at the stage we're at in the world today, um, what's your assessment in terms of India's interests? Where? How does India see this period of transformation and where strategically do you want to set your sights? Uh, well, first of all, Frank, good to see you and uh, I hope you're keeping well. Uh, so uh, let me respond to this. I think we don't have the luxury of sitting back, as you said, and looking at it. I think we need to wade in more and more. This is a very, very uh, tumultuous, uh, very dynamic global situation. Uh, so it's important to shape it, to participate in it, uh, uh, to to ensure that this goes the right way for us uh, and for the rest of the world. Now, uh, oh, you know, many of the challenges that you laid out uh, are really our major preoccupations. Uh, I think when we look uh, at uh, uh, what happened in Afghanistan and the region. Uh, I think these are this is going to have uh, very, very significant consequences for all of us, and we are uh, so close to the region. Uh, so uh, there are a set of uh, concerns and issues that flow from that. Uh, there is, a, uh, when we look on the other, to the east of India, uh, and you see the Indo-Pacific and, you know, uh, the, the importance there of really uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, uh, life goes on on the basis of uh, broad principles and concepts which the international community is comfortable with, you know, which is uh, concepts of rule of law, of uh, freedom of all flight and navigation, peaceful resolution of disputes or respecting territorial integrity. I mean, all, all these uh, do matter out there. I look at my own region. Uh, and when I look at my region, I think it's uh, it's important for me uh, that, you know, my prosperity and growth become a sort of a larger lifting tide for the region. Uh, and that the choices which are made in the region, not just by us, but by our neighbors as well, uh, are choices which are supportive uh, of a, a much more multipolar, much more democratic, much more rebalanced uh, uh, global situation. So, so there's, believe me, there's plenty to do and, uh, you know, we are at it. Minister, um, <clears throat> and clearly, as you un indicated in your remarks, at the core of your international perspective lies the American relationship. 
So let me turn to that for a moment and get you to talk a bit more. Um, you have mentioned frequently over the years India's commitment to multipolarity. Give me a perspective for your audience today as to how a relationship with the United States and a commitment to multipolarity work out in Indian foreign policy's vision? Well, uh, I, I think, Frank, you know, if we look back at a history with both of us uh, have, have uh, been through in our professional lives, uh, when we started with the Cold War and a, and a degree of, uh, I would say, polarization, but with countries like us very much in the middle trying to expand our space and our choices. Then uh, in the 90s, we moved to a world which was much more dominated by the United States. Now, today, what we are seeing is actually a rebalancing. I mean, if you look, for example, at the top 20 economies, that list is quite different from what it was 50 years ago. Now, if the economic list is different at some point of time, the political strategic list would also be different. And that's what's happening. And here, of course, uh, the rise of China has been the single biggest change. But, you know, the growth of India is also part of that uh, transformation. Uh, now, when we speak of a multipolar world, I mean, we do think today that the uh, the big issues of the day uh, cannot be decided by one or I emphasize two powers. Uh, I think it needs a larger group think, a group decide. It needs a buy-in by the rest of the world. Uh, so we need, I mean, in a sense, I would say uh, a more uh, uh, management board, which is much more fairly representative of the shareholders in our planet. Uh, and that's the what, what we advocate. And I think that's beginning to happen. And that, of course, does not detract from the U.S.-India relationship. It simply is no, a part of it. Not at all. On the, on the contrary, I would argue, I mean, uh, let us say among the major shareholders, they need to get along with each other. And uh, we are two who are very comfortable with each other and are getting more and more comfortable. And very frankly, I, I would also add that I see a big change in the at the American end, a much greater willingness on the part of the United States to work with other partners, not necessarily on terms that the U.S. has unilaterally set. I think the U.S. is also getting beyond the world, you know, that era of alliances and treaty based relationships. It's, it's, a, it's a far more uh, flexible, uh, you know, uh, I would say diverse, differentiated world out there. And I, I think American policymakers are beginning to adjust to that. And some of that you see in, in arrangements like what? That's a very encouraging statement about the United States. And I, I think at core, you're right. Uh, but one of the great changes in our relationship in my decades of experience with India has been the emergence of the Quad as a framework for bringing Indian action, Australian, Japanese, American action together. I wonder if you could pause and describe for all of us, what does the Quad mean for India? What is its purpose? What do you want it to accomplish? You know, I would uh, actually go beyond just uh, speaking for India because I think we've just come out of court. So I think I can speak with a fair degree of assurance on what the other three partners also feel. Look, we are four, four countries uh, actually located uh, at four different corners, if you would, of the Indo-Pacific uh, who are very, who have a lot of shared interests, who have a very common uh, I would say values and beliefs, uh, who as a consequence of all of this have a high degree of comfort on working together on the immediate and more than immediate uh, concerns uh, uh, of, of the uh, whole region. Now, uh, typically, you know, people tend to look at uh, uh, issues like, you know, maritime security, uh, exercises, uh, maybe connectivity, HADR. I mean, these were some of the early issues on it. But 
uh, I would argue that especially this year, uh, as all all four countries have invested more uh, energy and uh, uh, and uh, creativity into into Quad, we are actually seeing a whole lot of uh, new issues uh, which which come up. You know, uh, if if you look at this this leaders meeting, one uh, a big takeaway was a Quad uh, vaccine initiative, where the U.S. is actually giving the technology and the you know, to some degree, the resources. India is actually the production center of the vaccine. Japan is funding a lot of the purchasing of the vaccine. And Australia is helping out with the distribution of the vaccine. So you're going to be, we committed that we will, this initiative will, will deliver at least a billion vaccines uh, into the Indo-Pacific. Uh, or oh, let me give you another uh, agreement which we uh, worked out, which was on the principles of uh, technology, design, development, uh, governance, and use. Uh, because today, uh, you know, the usage of technology is a very, very important uh, subject in the international discourse. But there are, you know, uh, we are discussing critical emerging technologies. We are discussing health security. We actually announced a Quad Fellowship program. Uh, we've had, you know, resilient supply chains uh, is another issue. So semiconductor supply chains was an issue as well. So. It's, I think, broadened out which more. I think the more these four countries uh, with uh, their levels of comfort sit down, talk, look at the world, respond to the challenges. I think the beauty of Quad is precisely because it is not, you know, it is not rigid. It's not, a, it's not formal. Uh, it's, it's very comfortable and easygoing. I mean, we, you know, the agenda is made up responding to the uh, to the requirements of the of the uh, times uh, so uh, i actually see it very frankly as a as a very new model of uh, cooperation among like minded countries it's interesting as you go through the focus of the quad you've actually not mentioned china and while i, I think you're absolutely right to have given the quad a broad definition Give me some insight into India's perspective on how we, our two countries, are managing the complex issue of the rise of Chinese power. Uh, you've had a distinctive mm -hmm. approach to that. We've adopted ways of looking and dealing with China. Are we on the same track? Uh, you know, I want to make one thing uh, clear, Frank. The Quad is for things. It's not against somebody. And actually, if you look at the Quad statement, the Quad statement actually says that. You know, it says we are for rule of law. We are for freedom of overflight. We are for peaceful resolution of disputes. We are for democratic values. We are for territorial integrity of states. So I think it's very important not to be sort of uh, railroaded into some kind of negative discourse which actually is is not from uh, you know uh, our our script it is somebody else's script and i don't think we should fall for that i i think we need to be positive uh, you know uh, all of us have a fundamental right to cooperate with partners i think it's important that uh, others should not have a veto on our choices uh, it's part of a of a democratic world order uh, so uh, uh, but on your question of, you know, how do we uh, deal with the rise of China? Uh, I would say in many ways, uh, those are bilateral choices that all of us have to make. Uh, we, we each have a very substantial relationship with China. Uh, and uh, in many ways, you know, uh, China being today such a big player and uh, so salient in the international uh, economy, uh, I think it's natural that these relationships are quite unique. So what are my problems or my opportunities would not be the same as that for the United States or Australia or Japan or, you know, or in the Indonesia or uh, France. Uh, it's, it would be different for each country. But the fact is, again, I would put to you that, you know, the rise of, I mean, obviously the rise of China has had a very 
fundamental impact on the international order. Uh, so as, other, as participants in the international order, we need to uh, assess that and respond to that in the light of our own uh, uh, interest. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's, you know, uh, it's important, it's, it's sort of essential to look, normalize this conversation. You know, this should not end up as though it's some kind of ganging up and, uh, you know, and a negatively driven event. I, I don't think that's a fair description of what is a completely natural evolution of the international order to my mind. Minister, um, I, I hear you and uh, that's a very welcome message and signal. Let me bring you a little bit closer to home for a moment and that's the crisis that's still ongoing in Afghanistan. Um, this, the events of August are really dramatic. Um, as India looks at what's happened in Afghanistan, how do you assess the threat level that your nation now faces? And how are you responding to that? Well, uh, I think uh, to some degree, uh, Frank, we would all be uh, uh, will will all be justified in having uh, levels of concern, uh, and to some degree, I think the jury is still out. Uh, when I say levels of concern, uh, you know uh, there were commitments which were made by the Taliban uh, at Doha. I mean, you know, uh, the U.S. knows that best. I mean, uh, we were not taken into confidence. Uh, on various aspects of that. So whatever were the deals which were struck in Doha, uh, you know, uh, I mean, one has a broad sense, but beyond that, uh, you know, uh, are we going to see an inclusive government? Uh, are we going to see, you know, respect for uh, the rights of women, children, minorities? Most important, are we going to see uh, uh, an Afghanistan where, uh, which is not a, a uh, you know, which is whose soil is not used for terrorism against uh, uh, other states uh, uh, and, and the rest of the world. I think these are our uh, concerns. Uh, these concerns were actually captured uh, by a UN Security Council resolution in August uh, called 2593. Uh, and uh, uh, I think how, how those concerns are addressed uh, today is still an open question, uh, which is why I said the jury is uh, still out. So if you uh, ask me, are you concerned? Obviously we are. Uh, if you ask me, you know, how, is this the time to, you know, make uh, sort of draw sharp conclusions? I would, I would uh, sort of uh, take my time and study this with a certain degree of deliberation. Because as I said, uh, a lot of this, you know, whatever, whatever under understandings there have been, uh, you know, many of these are uh, not known to the inter international community. Minister, as the United States and India look at Afghanistan, are we on similar pages with regard to questions like recognition, assistance, uh, threat of terror, are our lines of communications open? Do we see things in a similar manner? I think we are on similar pages at a principal level on many of these issues. Uh, certainly, say, terrorism, uh, the usage of Afghan soil uh, for terrorism uh, is something which both of us feel very strongly. And it was something which was discussed uh, in uh, when uh, Prime Minister Modi met, uh, uh, you know, President Biden, it was in the outcome document. Uh, there, there, you know, again, look, there would be issues on which we would agree more. Uh, there would be issues on which we would agree less. Uh, our experiences in some respects are different than yours. Uh, you know, uh, we have been uh, uh, victims of cross-border terrorism ourselves. Uh, from from that uh, region uh, and uh, uh, you know we let us say that has shaped in many ways uh, our uh, view of uh, uh, some of the neighbors of Afghanistan so 
uh, now how much you know the u.s shares that view and where is it that the u.s uh, uh, sort of makes its tactical compromises i think that is for the americans to figure out minister that of course uh, includes the signals we jointly send to pakistan how do you see those signals evolving well, I, I mean, we uh, obviously watch uh, a lot of your own domestic debates uh, on this matter. And I noticed that you've been having a rather uh, animated debate on this subject uh, in the last few days. Uh, but uh, uh, um, as I said, you know, there are aspects that we share and there are aspects where maybe our positions are not exactly the same. Minister, we only have a moment left, um, and I want to get your view on one of the most consequential issues the entire world faces, and that's climate change. Glasgow is just on the edge. Uh, do you want to give us a picture of how India is approaching its commitments at Glasgow and the policies you intend to pursue? Well, look, I think as we go into Glasgow, and uh, Frank, I speak here as a veteran of Paris, uh, the, the world doesn't have that much good news. Uh, uh, the limited amount of good news includes the fact that India is the only G20 country which has kept its Paris commitments. Uh, and uh, there's been, a, you know, a, a, uh, enormous progress in terms of growth of renewable energy, uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency, uh, in terms of intensity of energy of emissions, uh, in terms of uh, for forestation, biodiversity, water usage. So I think we have a record which is a very, very credible record which we are taking into, uh, into Glasgow. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, we have our own uh, vision and ideas of what to do. Uh, uh, so, but I wish I could say that for the rest of the world, because uh, I, I, you know, I want you to reflect on this for a moment. Uh, we are supposed to go into Glasgow with a rescue the planet package. Okay. Compare the rescue the planet package of 100 billion, for which we are still struggling to raise resources with rescue America package. Think of what 100 billion means. Okay. 100 billion dollars is less than the money which NFL is making from media rights. And yet we are struggling to raise $100 billion. And we claim that it's an existential issue. So I think the world needs to get serious about it. Uh, you know, we need to strive for net zero, but net zero, global net zero means that the developing countries must still have the room to grow and that the developed countries need to do their own net zero and net minus. So we need a, a kind of a, I would say a more uh, sincere, more honest, uh, and uh, uh, frankly, a much more uh, serious uh, effort at addressing this challenge. Minister, you've given us a real treat today, a view of India's vision of the world and what's going on, of our relationship, the direction of the Quad, relations with China, how to deal with Afghanistan, and finally, a ringing statement on climate change. If we had more time, I would want to pursue economics, but I'm afraid the clock is run out, and I need to turn the floor back over to our hosts. But again, thank you, sir, for your candor and your willingness to be with us. Thank you. Pleasure as always. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let me now invite Ajit Mohan, USISPF India Advisory Board member and Managing Director and Vice President of Facebook India to deliver some closing remarks. Thank you. It, it's an absolute honor and privilege to go after that fantastic discussion between the Honorable Minister Jay Shankar and Ambassador Visna that covered such a wide range of issues that underlie the massive and accelerating strategic partnership between India and the United States. Thank you to the Honorable Minister for his candor and his willingness to address the many big areas of common interest, as well as the occasional differences 
uh, in this discussion, especially given that this is a community that is keen to see even greater depth and allyship between the two countries. And thank you to Ambassador Wisner for moderating the discussion. For all those of us watching this discussion, it highlights not just the massive progress that's been made in the last few years, not just the depth in the relationship between the two countries and the valuable role even non-governmental leaders and the private sector plays in augmenting this engagement between the governments. It also highlights yet again how critical this partnership is for shaping the future of the world, including the emerging economic order shaped by new technologies and the global collaboration around those technologies. India and the United States are both at the heart of a global transformation where digital is playing a central role in changing lives, in creating opportunity and in spurring entirely new models of innovation and enterprise. And, and I know the discussion did not uh, go into detail on the economic side, but the context of that discussion again underlines that when the United States and India come together to create global and interoperable frameworks and common standards, the world benefits, or to use the ambassador's language, when these two major shareholders in the world who get along with each other quite well come along to create global common frameworks, all of us benefit. Our promise to leaders from both India and the United States is that we stand by these important efforts to protect and create a more open world and one in which trade and investment in the two countries and between the two countries play a key role in spurring opportunity and prosperity on both sides. Minister Jai Shankar and Ambassador Vasna, thank you.